Bridget, she uses a combination of specialities for the benefit of her clients who need to talk about sex and sex related issues. That's a really good mix, isn't it? Sexologists with psychology and arts. Yeah. Um, she, she, creates, she creates an environment that's healthy, fun, productive, and most of all, safe and non judgmental. Um, Anika Henry, thank you so much for joining us. And I'd like you to tell us um, um, briefly. What's your take on intimacy and self-love, the importance of it? Okay, well, thank you so much for having me. Uh, let me first give a little bit of background. Um, I'd like to explain to people how I got into my quote-unquote sex work. Um, so I worked as an information education and communications officer for the HIV secretariat here in Tobago. Um, and it was while doing um, interventions around HIV prevention that I got interested in human sexuality with the curiosity or the interest or the concern really is how do we help people make better decisions around their sexuality so that, so that they did not put themselves at risk and so we could begin to reduce and manage um, our HIV infection rates. Um, and so I began looking for information on sexuality and negotiating what you want during sex, negotiating safer sex practices um, and that research led me to be more effective in how I helped people manage their, their sexual lives. That meant more and more persons kept coming to me and I did not have the information or the skills. And so I decided, okay, this looks like something that I need to study. And so um, I did my degree uh, in, in the US um, and came back home and continued to do some training um, in sex coaching. So that's, that's kind of me in a, in a nutshell in terms of how I got into this work. Um, in terms of my take on sex and intimacy, so we don't ever realize how important this is until something goes wrong. And only when something goes wrong do we realize how important um, sexuality and intimacy is for our lives. One of the things that I find, I, one of the issues that I find I deal a lot with in my practice, uh, women who come in to me and are unable to engage um, in, in terms of penetrative sex with a partner, because literally the, the vagina shuts down. Um, it almost feels like a brick wall. A lot of them, you know, explain that's how it feels. Um, and I've had women who have tried to do the religious thing, quote unquote, and keep themselves until, you know, marriage, until they found a partner that they committed to, and all of a sudden realize that they can't consummate um, the relationship. And so interestingly enough, in, in my part of the world, I find I've come across a lot of women who are unable to connect with a partner that way um, because they have embodied that sex negativity. You know, so all the years of, of thinking no, all the years of thinking this is dangerous unless it's within marriage, all the years of, of trying to armor my body so that I don't engage in sexual activity, all of that does not simply... Um, turn off and you don't all of a sudden turn on that sexy switch when mm. you partnership or when you are in a relationship. And so I've had to help quite a few women um, navigate that, learn to connect with their bodies. Um, as, as Habib said before me, uh, many, many women are really disconnected uh, from their bodies. And until they learn to embrace their bodies, until they learn to love their bodies, mm -hmm. um, they learn to fully accept themselves, they they really aren't able to share that fullness, that wholeness, that sense of erotic energy with a partner. And therefore, the, uh, the level of closeness that can happen through sexuality, through sharing of erotic energy and erotic, erotic space just doesn't happen. And so they are unable to embrace and fully live the potential of their, of their eroticism. Um, and that can be really painful for a lot of women to, to deal with. To, mm. you know. um, yeah, to, it's, it's sad. It's been sad. I have, I have, I've literally um, had, to, have to, had to hold space for women while they cried for what they've lost. Mm. I've literally had to hold space for women who numb in their pelvic area, can't, can't feel anything, who are so dissociated during sexual activity to the point where they fall asleep. Um, and so part of the work that I have been training to do in addition to what I already have as a sexologist is body work, somatic sex education, where I am teaching people how to touch, how to heal through touch, 
how to get their bodies to respond to stimuli in, in a way that pleases them, in a way that they enjoy, so that they can then teach their partner. And even if they don't have a partner, learning to enjoy that energy on their own, learning to respect and see their sexuality and their sexual energy as something that's sacred and that's healing mm -hmm. and that's fun. Um, so that, that has been my experience. And that's, that's a lot of what my work involves. Mm -hmm. as well as well, I'm a sex educator, so I do teach the youth mm -hmm. so that they make the same mistakes that we, that we did as adults. Um, mm -hmm. and, and hopefully they have less trial and error because they mm -hmm. don't have information and knowledge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, and hopefully they, um, they are better at embracing, and embracing their sexuality and mm -hmm. negotiating safer sex practice mm -hmm. than my generation, my generation was. You know, so, so yes. So did you just, did you say you, you work with youth just now? Yes, yes. I, I was so I was which, which brings me to the question: How do you feel that um, you know the current situation with the internet and pornography has has impacted on boys? Because um, some of us were well, having a conversation recently, and people were saying how some young boys don't even realize that pom pom has hair on it, because when they watch porn, they see all these bald bald fannies. And, and, oh all my gosh. Sexual acts and, and all these sexual acts that happen and they think, you know, fellatio is, 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 you know, they just have a distorted view of what, what's expected. So how, how, how do you, have you come across yeah. that? How does, yeah, is that? Is, so so, so, so I, I want to, um, I want to, uh, how do I say this? So that, that, that story or that case of, of young boys not realizing that um, vulvas have hair, mm. we have that hair too. Like literally, I had that case a few years ago oh. when with the HIV secretary, same thing. He mm. was just disgusted because the only sex education he had <laughs> was porn. Um, mm. The good news is, is that porn literacy is a thing. It is part of sex education. Ah, oh, uh, right. Mm -hmm. Point out to our youth that one, this is fiction. Mm -hmm. This is fiction. Two, these do not, the images you see here do not represent the average body or the average skill. None of us have these gymnastic skills that can, you know, put ourselves in all these strange contortions. Um, nobody usually is able to maintain an erection for that long. <laughs> That's the other thing, yes. Under that heat, <laughs> in all those lights and, you know, the camera all up in your business. Like. And so when we begin to break down just mm. how, how much of porn is fiction and not real, mm. and down the communication that's happening between these actors, I mean, make sure mm. that we actors, um, you know, they begin to realize, oh my gosh, you know, we cannot base mm. our own... Um, sexual actions and activities and values are what we're seeing here because this is not real. Mm -hmm. So that is a body of work or curriculum and lesson plans. That's I can imagine. Yes, when you mentioned porn literacy. porn literacy, I was like, of course. Yes. Yes, that that's, makes that's perfect, that means. makes perfect sense. I think that sh that should be in every school and every curriculum. Actually, yes. <laughs> yes. Fully agree. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. We we will come back to you. In Sorry, um, we have a question for Anika, um, and one is, how do you teach body work? Oh, okay. So, um, permission to be explicit? <laughs> yes, it's adults. If you're not, if they, you know, if you can't handle it, these are not the sessions for you. <laughs> yeah, uh, Dr. Yancey said earlier, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Permission right. to be so, explicit. So, so, so touch is involved. Um, if I'm seeing a client face to face, we literally go through different ways of touching the body. So I mm. teach face to face. So, you know, we, and we do full body touch, whether it's a massage of the scalp, you know, the arm, playing with the fingertips, pinching the fingertips. We come all the way down to the body and we explore different kinds of touch um, using uh, so different strokes, different rhythms of the same strokes, different pressure, different angle, different patterns. Um, and so we vary the different kinds of strokes that we apply to the entire body. And as the client is on my table, so I use a massage table, the client is on my table, um, I ask, okay, more pressure or less pressure? Mm -hmm. Or slower? Yeah. yeah. Do you like this pattern? Is it, do you like anti-clockwise or clockwise? Do we want a pattern where it's long strokes and short strokes followed by a circle? And so there's literally a mapping of pleasure on the body through mm -hmm. touch. 
Um, if my client is virtual, because I've also done it virtual, I have a pelvic model. Um, so um, let me just grab. Um, I'll be right back. <laughs> okay. That's good. I really love the way she talked about um, porn literacy and, and I probably need to start a campaign to have that done in all the schools. <laughs> um, so yeah, I I'm, I'm, I'm still in my office today, so I thought I would do it. Okay, talk. great. great. So if I'm teaching this remotely, I will talk and I, I do need to get another type of vulva and vagina to demonstrate on, but this one, you know, shows... Um, the, the, the vaginal passage. And I'll talk about what to do with the outer lips, what to do with the inner lips, how to touch, you know, each part of the vaginal wall to different kinds of strokes, feel the difference in the tissues. The certain tissues prefer certain kinds of pressure or touch of anti-clockwise or clockwise. Um, and I would do the same thing for, you know, penis owners. <laughs> Not of the real one. Different, different strokes. <laughs> Usually over here we should have been pink. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh, no. um, and so I would, if it's, if it's virtual, um, I would use my models to, to do the instructions and they'd be on the other side. And camera on, camera off. So they don't need to have the camera on and they don't need to have the camera focused on their genitals. It's so whatever their comfort level is. And I simply guide them through the different kinds of, of touch um, if we're doing a genital mapping or a pleasure mapping or, or even uh, masturbation coaching, that is a thing. Um, mm. People can mm. ask mm. about that later. Mm. Um, mm. Uh, but but yes, yeah, that, that is how I teach um, body work in terms of uh, therapeutic intervention for someone. One, trying to recover from trauma. It's critical for someone trying to recover from trauma to do body work. Mm. And persons who simply uh, may be recovering from surgery, and so the body has changed um, and there, may be, there might be scarring that needs to be addressed. So I would do scar tissue massage and scar tissue remediation. Um, and it may be somebody who simply want to explore their full erotic potential and they want to learn what's possible. Um, so yeah, I hope that's the question. Thank you, Sandra Wilson, for that question. Um, 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 Dr. Yancey. Um, how are you? How, how do you think things are going at the moment? Very interesting. Our first two speakers. Yes. What do you think? And I just wanted for those who've been here before in our sessions, you know, I love to give some homework. I wonder if you, and has anyone been doing the homework I gave? So let me tell you. For those who don't know, the yes. last bit of homework was that you were meant to take a magnifying mirror and have a look at your vulva and your vagina. Open the lips, scrutinize. See if you can labor the parts, know what they are, because you have to become familiar with your own body. body. Now, I'm not a, a sexologist, I'm a psychosexual therapist. So my avenue is a little bit different. So most of what I deal with is people who are um, recovering from trauma in, in that aspect. But also as someone who has lived with vaginal atrophy, um, which I will explain, due to menopause, I had to learn my own body because... With the menopause, one of the symptoms can be the dryness of the, vag the vaginal wall and the vulva, and then it cracks, it splits, it tears, it hurts, making sex impossible a lot of the time, sexual penetration impossible. One of the things I didn't know when I was growing up was the fact that I should be moisturizing the lips, the vulva because it does help. Now, there are some people who think lubricant and moisturizers are the same. And when I say moisturizer, I'm not talking any fancy thing of the chemist, you know, pure coconut oil, make sure whatever it is is very hygienic. You got to take your precautions, but things like that help. Now, when you're working with someone who has been traumatized, um, whether through rape or whatever the consequences are, and some of it is quite traumatic, apart from just the mental bit that you work with, you work with the body. So I, I'm listening to what Onika is saying, and yes, that does work phenomenally to support a lot of women. In addition, it's you've got to know your body. So, you know, people giggle when I say, get your mirror, have a look, scrutiny, touch. It is good to touch yourself. I know there was one workshop I did when I said to the, the, the individual, take the mirror and look. And she was like, oh, I, I can't look. I'll ask my man to do that. I'm not going to look down there. And I'm yeah. thinking, well, if it's ugly it's for you and you're going, oh, why should he do it? I actually say, do you know what it tastes like? Do you know what it smells like? 
It's yours. Why not? You need to know these things. It's your mm -hmm. body. So how are you going to say to someone what you like if you don't even know for yourself? Mm -hmm. Look after your, your, your parts, male and female. You know, men, this is to you too, you know, you look. I mean, I speak from a female perspective because I've got vagina, vagina and vulva. But look at your penis. Look at your scrutin scrutinize, touch, feel, smell, handle it. It's yours. Yes, I'll stop calling it pum pum. I really need to 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 not to stop doing that. But um, yes, Yancy did set homework, and I hope I hope <laughs> those of you who were at our last session, I do hope you did the homework. Because I must say, since I started hosting these events, um, I was surprised at the amount of women who've never looked at their um self. It really shocked me because um, I've been doing that from as a teen. Um, yeah. So pre 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 um sexual activity and what it looked like before and what it looked like after I lost my you know interesting that so many so many women um big women women menopause women never ever ever looked so yeah that's quite a shock so those of you on the on the on the call tonight you know there's 56 look i'm looking at 56 people do your homework all of you as 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 uh Yancy said okay so now I'm going to introduce to you Rael Sims. Rael's been on our, on our program before, so he understands and knows exactly what goes on here. But I'm going to introduce him uh, to those of you who don't know him. He's a cognitive neuropsychologist, a behaviorist. He's a motivational speaker and the leading authority on the neuroscience of relationships worldwide. Uh, he's a licensed and certified relationship coach, counsellor, marriage facilitator, body language expert uh, with the Relationship Coaching Institute at the Prepare Enrich program. So Rio has a passion for analysing the neuroscience of love by dissecting why we do what we do from an eco, bio, physio, psycho, social, spiritual point of view. Yes, he's also quite spiritual. He's very nice. And um, so Rio, I'd like to ask you, like I asked everyone else, what, in terms of your work, you know, what do you think about intimacy and self-love? So, you know, you I think it's so, I think it's so important. I think it's really, really important. And um, I would like to comment on the vaginal canal too, about the lubrication sure. as well. Yeah, I think it's really important for self-love. I mean, you have to really take out time to know self before you venture into the relationship arena. And you have to not only saying you have to know self personally. Oh, I just wanted to apologize to everybody. My computer decided to do an update. So I had to just sit there and wait until it did its update. So I really, really apologize. We've all been through that one. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I really apologize. Um, yeah, so yeah, it's so, so important. And, and not just knowing self, uh, um, emotionally but also knowing self physically like what we were like you guys were saying uh just now it's so important to understand self and why is that important to understand self so when you get with an, a significant other uh, you know i remember a long time ago there was a mantra that used to go around in, in where I, um in chicago i was raised in chicago and sexually women would say uh, you know if they were with a mate and uh, the mate didn't know how to please her, she would say, I don't have time to, please, to teach no man. I don't have time. Well, the thing is, is that men are born to know how to please every woman because every woman, uh, uh, she, she desires something different than the other woman, right? So it's important for you to know yourself so you're able to articulate that to him to let him know what it is that you actually like. Right. So that's what's so important about knowing self inside and outside and mentally and physically. So it's really, really important to love self. And my my slogan is uh, my my slogan is respecting self is knowing self in order to love self. So you have to respect yourself by respecting yourself is like, hey, I want to know more about me. Right. So I can love me. Because that's what we talk about a lot. We, we you know, we we give that, we give that advice about loving self, right? So we have to teach and and help them to be mindful as to well, what is loving self? And loving self is knowing self. 
get to know you first. You know, when somebody asks you, tell me about yourself, I'm not asking you to tell me about yourself, uh, that you're an attorney and that you are a doctor, you know, you were raised that. No, I'm, I'm asking you to tell me about you, right? And it's difficult for us to say that. That's why immediately we tell you what we are and not who we are, right? Because we don't take out that time to really know self. Thank you so much. Thank you, Real. Yes, so many people are defined by what they do. And you think to yourself, and if you lose your, your job, then who, 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 who are you? You know, they don't take time to actually know themselves you know, outside of the role, which is quite sad, really. Um, yeah. Yes, knowledge of self. Yeah, exactly. You know, we need to know who we are, really who we are. I, once I was in a conversation with a, a, a guy, I think a dating thing, and um, I said something about, you know, telling, showing him um, what, what, how to pleasure me. He said, no, no, you don't, you don't need to tell me anything. I know what to do. It's not like, you know, you're not the first woman I've gone with. I said, right. yeah, but you've never been with me before. Exactly. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So, you know, there are, there are men out there who think they know how to pleasure everybody. I thought myself, no, I, you know, that was a, no, that was a no, no right there. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, we could give the benefit of the doubt that there's common things, right. But, uh, you know, there's certain things mm. that we prefer ourselves as an individual person, right? Mm. And um, I appreciate, and, and how do you pronounce it? Uh, on, Anika? Onika? Onika, Onika. Onika. <laughs> yeah. And, and say it again? I like the way she said it. Oh, Onika. Onika, okay. Like, and, and, and we need more people like Onika, too, to also mm. just educate us about um you know when it comes to sex and the vaginal canal mm -hmm. and how it works and where certain spots are where the g spots and the vulva yeah. and and what's important of those you know those things yeah. are important too as well yeah. and um i like i, I like what, what when i came in what we were talking about and i also wanted to just add on to when we we're talking about the vaginal canal and to uh when dryness and lubrication and I might have mentioned this before, but that one key thing, too, that I like to also add in there is kissing. Yes, I know. I last time you talked about kissing, yes. Let's well, do it again. Is it okay? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, kissing. Because, yeah. see, we think kissing is so, like, minute and so minor, mm -hmm. but also it helps, too, as we get older, because that's just one tool. Uh, as far as, uh, you know, see, I get nervous when I get ready to say uh, uh, Yanni's doc doctor's name too as well. I have to get used to saying the names. But um, yeah, so that's one of the keys is kissing. Why? Because when we kiss woman, she receives testosterone from the male uh, saliva. So that testosterone goes into an area called the ventral tegmental area, the cardiac nucleus, the nucleus accumbens area, which is part of the dopaminergic area. But what that is, is actually the, the, the pleasure center part of the brain. And that pleasure center part of the brain uh, triggers the thalamus and the pituitary to send signals to the vaginal canal to, to lubricate. And so this is one of the reasons that uh, the kissing is so important because not only when it lubricates, it also goes through a process uh, when, it, when it's to, to fill the blood in the, the vaginal canal walls, right? Just in, so it can grip what goes in. But the cervix also pushes the uterus back too as well, just in case seven to 10 inches goes in and it doesn't damage the vaginal canal and doesn't damage Because you know, when one man says, oh, I can feel his penis in my stomach, but you don't actually feel the penis in your stomach, you actually feel your uterus hitting your stomach. And that's why it's so important to make sure that you go through the, uh, us men, this message is to the men, um, excuse me. That's why it's so important for men to be patient and to you know, go let the woman go through the process of, of foreplay so she can become lubricated and that process of the cervix moving the uterus back so she doesn't damage her uterus and damage the vaginal canal and to allow the lubrication to start in the vaginal canal, the vaginal walls to be filled with the blood too as well. And I'm just saying that's just one thing you know, of, of other things that we mentioned already. 
right? But I think kissing is, is, is so important. And sometimes we, um, we stop kissing. You know, we kiss when we first meet. We kiss all day. We kiss, 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 like, you know, and have sex like rabbits, right? And then when we get, you know, comfortable with each other, then we stop the kissing. Mm. But that also helps the, the vaginal canal to lubricate too as well. Mm. I mean, KY Jelly Company knows a lot about me because I used to, when I tour and talk about this, I'm like, look, you don't need KY Jelly unless you really, really need it. Just kiss, 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 you know. <laughs> but I'm not Xing out the KY Jelly too, but I'm just saying, yeah. uh, why don't you try the natural way too as, mm. as well, right? You know, because we're talking about when we reach the menopause stage, then yeah, you know, we're gonna need some type of uh, lubrication during that period. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I remember you're talking about mature relationships and people been together for a while. And like you say, when they're in the menopause phase, you talked about kissing. Kissing is so delicious, yummy and lovely. Can I, can I interject quickly? Yes, Anika, sure. Yes, I just, just want to point out, um, that women, we have two sets of lips. So, you know, kissing, there's the lips on the face and then there's the lips in the pelvis area. All right. So if we're going to be talking about kissing, we get kissing everywhere that has lips and everywhere that doesn't have Absolutely. That's absolutely. 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 Yeah, crucial in my so world. Right. You are so right. And, you know, mm -hmm. even too, there's been many studies about um, the, the size of the vagina also based on your lips up here yes i've heard that yeah so i i remember i i remember speaking in berkeley uh university berkeley university and the person who organized it was the ministers the first wife and of of this um church that was in the area she went on stage and start talking about that. I was like, I wanted to feel embarrassed, but I was like, oh my God. She was like, let me tell you, young ladies, when men look at your lips, they think about down there. They think about, oh, she must have a juicy vagina because <laughs> she's got juicy lips. And I was like, oh my God, okay. You know, so I was glad that she brought it up and I didn't have to. So that was totally awesome. <laughs> Is there anyone who wants to speak? You want to put your hand up and say anything? Okay, if not, I'm going to go to, I think, I think Nicole is now with us. I'm going to introduce Nicole. Uh, Nicole Joseph Chin is a US board breast care specialist and she specializes in the innovation and development of specialty gender health education programming using her globally unique uh, innovation model. So, uh, Nicole, are you, are you in yet? I am. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Hi. Welcome. The question I'm asking our guests is, uh, in terms of your work, you know, how, how important is intimacy and self-love? How, how is it incorporated into what you do? Uh, just briefly, because we're opening the floor to, to, to conversations. Thank you and good evening. I'm seeing so many familiar faces mm -hmm. and it's beautiful to be here and to share with you. From where I sit, my work involves the most visible part of the sexual anatomy of a woman and that's her breasts. The most desirable body <laughs> part, also the part of the body that is the most nurturing. It's the place where we go to to feel that sense of comfort. It's the place that feeds the newborn child. It's also the place that nurtures and nourishes the lover, the partner. So breasts play a very important role. And uh, it also allows us to appreciate our femininity. It's a definition of gender and of gender positioning even in the role of someone who is transitioning genders. So it is a key body part or key part of the anatomy. And it's where a lot of arousal happens as well. And the arousal is and can be visible. So that is actually dual because while it happens from the perspective of the woman being aroused, 
by the touch or the foreplay with her breasts. It also is a key arousal facet of the human anatomy to the other party. So absolutely, it is something that we pay close attention to when we're speaking about body love and particularly where we understand that there are so many women that are also impacted by loss of a breast due mm. to an ailment. And because it's a visible part of the body, that loss also is very impactful on her dignity, mm. her self-esteem, mm. her self-worth, mm. the perception that she has of herself and that people have of her. However, there are many women who go on to have pregnancies following a breast cancer diagnosis and a mastectomy. My role is to make the breasts never look like they ever left, non-surgically. So I play a very important part mm. in being the breast esteem advocate for the developing girl, the woman who has been diagnosed, the woman during her menopause and changes in her life, the pregnant mother who feels messy after breastfeeding and thinks, mm. oh my God, my body is no longer. So there are many layers to the work that I do. And it's very captivating because I get to transform the woman. Mm. I get to transform her man. I get to transform how she feels about her anatomy and herself. And most of all, I get to hear her story and to see where she gets into her journey of re-emerging as a sexy butterfly. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. I just remember that last time you were here, there was a woman on, uh, on our chat. I don't know how many women, but I know one in particular. She wanted a consultation with you. <laughs> so, uh, yes. Yes. Yes, you, you do inspire many. And um, maybe you might get some more women in here tonight who want a, a breast. I don't, I don't even know why, what she was consulting you for, but hey, fittings. I think she wanted to... We do bra to, fittings. We do breast it. esteem yes. consultations. Yes, she wanted we fittings. We also build, yes, we also build prosthetics, breast prosthetics. Ooh, wow. We do, yes. So we do a plethora of things around the breasts. And we also provide the most amazing garments. So it's a combination of things. Hmm. Thank you so much. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Nicole, oh. do you still have your mold? <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. yes. We just can't see this tonight. Okay. Mm, thank okay. you. Okay. Any, any questions? Any questions to any of our speakers now? We're going to open the floor to our interact because we like our events to be interactive. I don't know if Habib wanted to come back in and say anything um, given all that he's heard so far. Is there anything you'd like to say, Habib? We're opening up the floor now to, for conversations. Please don't be shy. Use the chat, put your hand up. My, my um, second in command, Nicole, is, is, is looking out for you. Yeah. And we'll um, get you to speak. Just one thing I wanted to add while, while we're waiting sure. for her to come back was, um, so early on we were discussing that you know, the women should be kind of looking after themselves so that they know what to say to their partners in terms of pleasure. But I just wanted to say that also that applies to same-sex relationships because though you may be the partner of the same sex, they may not necessarily understand your particular body. Everyone's mm. body is different mm -hmm. and when Habib was um, referring to the, the G spot it actually just um, came to mind that he, he said it was after the German doctor and likewise the Kegel bar and we know oh, what yes. Kegel bar those oh, of yeah. us who've been in the other sessions yeah. that's also named after a, a German doctor oh the Kegel wow yeah Dr. Kegel mm. funny enough but mm. um in, and same-sex partners could use the key girl bar. Yeah, definitely. Key girl yeah. Bars, as we know, but you need to know your own body because if, you, if you're inserting it into your body, you have to be quite careful. It may it's very heavy. <laughs> oh. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Okay, that's the point. It is yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So that's different true. people, it works different ways to different people. There are different types. There's yeah. a bar with the weight. Some are heavier, some are lighter, and there are different things you can use to build muscle right. in the in the wall. Yeah, yeah. And they have a lot of new ones now that are not heavy, that are smaller and designed in certain oh. that yes. can actually you know touch the G spot, and they're just oh. like you know they're they're just as small as this. Oh, really? Oh. But they're designed, they're curved. So when it goes in, it'll go straight up and it'll it'll touch, you know, the, mm -hmm. the uh, top wall where it can actually reach the G spots too as well. Oh. Um, I'll get the names for you. And it's a lot of them, different ones yes. that I recommend. I'll just oh, get thank you. Yeah. I can show some in a minute. I'll just quickly grab my that, Yeah. Anika, I bought one I know, ages I ago. And it was so heavy. I never managed to use it. Never, never. Yeah. And I know it Amika was a while back. So they've improved them over the years, it sounds like. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, Fabulous. we have a raised hand from Kirsty Sharp. Hello, Kirsty. And ask a question. And is she yes. muted? Yeah, I've asked her to unmute. Are you gonna ask? Can you hear me? Uh, yes, Kirsty, we can. Okay, great. Um, I just have a question about, um, I've heard some statistics, whereas with a one, woman's orgasm, that it's either one of two things, it's either clitoral or vaginal. Is that true? Is it, so, so Kirsty's question is, in terms of the, the orgasm, it can be vaginal or clitoral, and she wants to know, is that true? I would if say it is true, it. is there a person? Is there a what, Kirsty? Is there a per is there a percentage like of women who women are, are more right? Which way? That's a good. That's a good point. I mean, I can. I have it both ways, <laughs> but um, it's not the same for everybody. As it's, we're all different. I'll, I'll turn it over to Yancy. Do you want to reply to that? Who wants to reply to that? Or Onika? So I'm seeing Habib unmuted. So Habib, you go first, and I'll, I'll add. Oh, Habib is back. Okay, great. Yeah, so um, it's a very good question, but it, it, the issue is when we're speaking about um, the different types of orgasms, like whether, you know, vaginal orgasms, clitoral orgasms, in reality, they're all, they're all, 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 all orgasms are clitoral orgasms. And so like a vaginal orgasm, so, I mean, there's studies that show that night that approximately like twenty-five percent of women can regularly experience an orgasm via penetrative intercourse, and that's what generally people refer to as a vaginal orgasm. Not realizing, well, a lot of people don't realize that even during penetrative intercourse, the clitoris is being indirectly stimulated. Yes. So even though you're calling it a vaginal orgasm, it's also mm. actually a clitoral orgasm. Mm. And then, um, but for most women, the most effective and reliable route to experience an orgasm is via clitoral um, clitoral orgasm, where generally the whether the woman by herself or her partner would stimulate the clitoral glands. So that's why you, you will see some studies that say like 95% of women experience a clitoral orgasm, whereas 65% of women or even or 25% of women experience a vaginal orgasm. But I don't like to put them in um, camps because again, some women, the most effective route is direct um, clitoral stimulation, some is indirect, whatever works for you. And um, and the reason why I think a lot of this stems from what Freud said, Sigmund Freud, where he said that immature women do not immature women experience clitoral orgasms, where the mature woman experiences um, a, vag a vaginal orgasm. And because obviously he was thinking as a man, a woman needs to experience an orgasm by penetrative intercourse, because that's how most men experience an orgasm. Mm. Whereas we know it's not the most effective group for women. So I don't like to use, even though I miss a number of like quote unquote types of orgasm in reality mm. most of them are actually clitoral orgasms by mm. way of the organ the clitoris is being stimulated directly so mm. yeah but again like what dr um, you, um yvonne said whatever works for you if you can experience both or but ultimately it's about um finding a route that works for you rather than kind of focusing on what the percentages are and things like that that's, that's my um thoughts on the subject Thank you. Can I Abby. also real fast? Real fast. Can I also say? Yeah, sure. Depends. And then I it, it also depends on too uh, the position that you're in because that's, that's what I was going to say. On top, yeah. Um, the way you move on top, top. if you know, sometimes it doesn't have to be up and down, but 
in and out because you're also rubbing the clitoris at the same time and could also be touching the g-spot too at the same time so if you're moving in motion if you notice if you're moving in and out not up and down it's also rubbing the clitoris where you can almost get you know it it, it uh, complements each other where you can get uh that explosion where both are being stimulated at the same time yes thank you yeah that's gonna say positioning um, Anika. Anika. <laughs> so, so I'm going to add a completely different take or perspective. Oh, okay. Yeah, the expert. Yeah, the expert. <laughs> and um, so I'm I'm going to add from a from sex research and a sexologist perspective that orgasms are brain based, um, and while we will describe ways in which we achieve orgasm in the body, whether we do it through clitoral stimulation or vaginal stimulation, et cetera. It's, it's basically brain-based. Um, and that has come to light, or we have, we have begun to understand that when we look at persons who may have disabilities and therefore from the waist down, there is no, you know, no real sensation. Um, we do know that for, for women who are engaging in penetrative sex, like 80% of them would need to have direct or indirect clitoral stimulation. So that's a fact that like the clitoris, like, don't ignore it. You know, eight out of 10 of us need that either directly or indirectly if we're talking about penetrative sex yeah, to experience orgasm. But there are also women who experience orgasms just from stimulating the breast and nipples. You don't, oh, even, yes. have to, you don't even have to touch, you know, um, um, the vagina or the vulva or, or the clitoris. And then there are women who like really deep penetrative touch. And so there's, a, there's anterior of the cervix in front or there's a posterior of the cervix already deep where they may have more pressure sensitive nerve endings mm -hmm. and women who experience orgasm through anal pleasure, then through urethral stimulation. And then there are those who learn through breath work and through imagination how to experience orgasm that way so that touch isn't even a part of the equation. Um, so I'm saying all of that to say that a lot of it, a lot of the way in which we experience pleasure is based on how our brain um, is interpreting and, and receiving stimuli. Um, and our, our imagination, our beliefs, um, our openness to receiving stimuli at many different levels um, is part of, of what enables us to experience orgasms in many, many, many different kinds of ways. Um, and so um, one of the things that, um, that, I, that I teach in our body work uh, is the ability to use your breath and use sound and use a clenching of your pelvic floor muscles to spread sexual energy through the body so that you can experience full body orgasms. You know, so there's this nice tingly sensation that could last for more than, for more than a day. Um, so don't limit your body. Don't limit your thinking in terms of different ways to experience orgasm. The body is a wonderland. And I also want to point out in terms of research, this is my pet peeve, my personal bias when it comes to research. I always take it with a grain of salt, um, especially if it's, if it's coming from a Western space. Mm -hmm. um, I've recognized that a lot of the research um, is what we call WEIRD, W-E-I-R-D. Each letter stands for something. So WEIRD as in Western persons, educated persons, industrialized spaces, rich persons, democratic. So, <laughs> <laughs> and that is a really small percentage of the rest of the world. Yes. Uh, it's like a teeny tiny percent of the world population. May not be a good way to gauge how mm -hmm. most are uh, engaging and experiencing life. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. Yancy, you wanted to show us the, the, the um, bars? Okay, yes. Um, so the Kegel bar, I don't know if you can ah, see. Ah, yeah. So this is, um, I think this is the one you said that's heavy. All right. And it works two ways. So it's um, mainly used for um, pelvic floor exercises and you can either use it this way up and the, the spot that people are referring to is the G-spot. This bit of the bar can touch on it and increase stimulation. For women who have vaginal atrophy as a result of menopause, if you put the bar in the fridge and you cool it down, it's metal. It's quite, it feels quite soothing when you insert it into the, the vaginal cavity. And then there's the other end, which you can use to grip to do the actual exercise. I think what Dr. Rial was referring to was these smaller ones, which is also the same thing. You use them to grip, 
to have with pelvic floor exercises and they come in different sizes. Mm. And then they are the, so, for, you know, we work with people who are LGBTQIA plus and trans people, and these are different sizes, that dilators that you can also use to help with the muscle down there. And these are by the German man, Mr. Kegel. Yeah. So, so my Kegel thing is, is, I bought it over 10 years ago, and it's a very different looking thing. Oh, no. But um, I also bought some balls, so yeah, it's not looking like that at all. Okay, but I'll show it to you. I'll show it to you one day. This one isn't that heavy. Yeah, no, the one I've got is. Anyway, um, Ron, you have so, the one so with this... weights that have like a hundred pound weights and all yeah, of that. Yeah, it's like, it's like a long thing, heavy, really, like made from okay, stone or granite or something. Yeah, okay, and it costs a lot of money, you know. But uh, anyway, um. Yes, yeah, so um, I guess I'm just saying to to the fifty odd people in the room, and we we also have practical tools oh, that we can demonstrate. <laughs> you know, don't run with us. You know, this is a serious uh, serious um, gathering. Okay, any questions? Are there any questions? Anything? Any burning questions? Anybody wants to ask? Thank you so much for that question before. Nicole, any anybody? Yes, ready? there was a question from earlier, and it was about someone asking about perimenopause. There's been a lot of talk about pre and post um, yes. menopause and lubrication regarding perimenopause. I think Yancy has put I'll a book in. Explain. Yeah, so the yeah, perimenopause is the time just before you mm. go through menopause and it can, it can be up to five years prior to menopause. Menopause is actually 12, 12 months after not having a period. That's when you have menopause. And any time beyond that, the 12-month mark, you're post-menopause. But most people just call all of the post-menopause period menopause. Now, with perimenopause, once, I mean, there's no age. Some young people in their 30s start perimenopause. But once there's a green checklist, and I'll tell you, refer you to the website, it's on our website, that you can go through and tick some of the symptoms. And if you have a certain number of those symptoms, we advise that you see your GP who can take you through some of the things you can do when you're coming through to perimenopause. Diet is important. Exercise is important. Looking after your general wellness is important. And please, please moisturize top to toe because the dryness can really impact on you. Hydration, as someone said, that's also very important. Now, one of the things that happens, it, it may not happen to a lot of, necessarily to everyone, but it happens to a lot of people, they drip, what I call the drip, urine incontinence. So you sneeze, you drip. You cough, you drip. You laugh, you drip. Not everyone, but it happens to a lot of women. There are things you can do, like Kegel bar to strengthen the exercises, but it won't last forever. It, it will come to an end. The fan, I've yeah. always got my fan here. Actually, I've got two here for the hot flushes. Some people have hot flushes. Some have actual, like I had, or felt like a volcanic explosion. Lots of symptoms, but as you peri and you see the symptoms are coming, sort your diet out. For some people, sugar is the enemy. So they mm. start cutting down on your sugars, getting your exercise in. It's just, they're just about taking the precautions. It is what it is. It's part of life, which we should embrace. And I kid you not, I've gotten to the point where I couldn't give a damn and I'm embracing it. You know, it's like whew, liberation. <laughs> Yeah, it's, I, I, it's a period to look forward to, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it is. It is liberating as well, absolutely. It's, it's, it's and I think now, no yeah, one is. No, and I, I also think that um, caffeine can also stimulate many wo women. So think about caffeine, alcohol, apparently chocolate, alcohol. Yeah, uh -huh. sugar is right, but yeah, but think about all the all the uh, uh, green tea, which is supposed to be kind of okay, but you know, in during this time it can really stimulate um, the aspects of our lives. But I know and that tea and coffee can be... Sex. Some people don't want. Some people, they like a rabbit. They want a lot, you know? Yeah. And men, 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 talk about them a bit about them, because there are some people in here who might... Talk about the situation with men, where women are not talking to men about the menopause, Yancy. Well, yes. Touch so, on that a bit, and how men get lost. They do. So partners get lost. Having, 
workshops with some brothers, with some men. And one of the things they have been saying is that they don't know how to approach the subject with their partners or their family members, even mothers, whatever it is. And so in the workshop, we were discussing um, some of the things that they should be looking out for. But what they were actually saying is that they would like to know more. They would like to be invited to spaces like this. And I noticed someone saying, actually, they're not in the space, though we've invited them. But they want to know more information. But sometimes that's quite difficult because if you don't know what's happening to you, it's hard to explain it to someone else, mm. you know? But the important thing is, I think, to have some sort of line of communication. Mm. And if you don't know, say you don't know to the partner, to the friend, whoever it is, but try to find the information because there are men out there who are saying that they're willing to support us. They're willing to support their partners, their mothers, their sisters, etc. but they just don't know how. And mm. we've got this kind of societal image that menopausal women or menopausal people are angry and aggressive. And I remember when I was doing the research eight years ago, there was a paper I saw um, from American University that was specifically said, during menopause, black women become very aggressive, we smell, and mm. um, we are angry. So aggressive, smell, and angry. It was a, a, an academic paper I found that in. And I thought, sheesh, what do I have to look forward to? But that's just based on someone's notion of what Black women are like. But it's, it's permeated through society. So a lot of people buy into that narrative and think, actually, we are aggressive and we are angry. Listen, y'all, if you're going through menopause, you're going to be angry. You, you don't know what you're going through. This constant having to too fan <laughs> it's, it's, it's not easy a woman shouldn't be embarrassed about it i think some i think too many women are, are probably embarrassed about menopause and like you say they don't know and you know if you if you don't know um, one, of, one of the sessions we had women were talking about how nobody in their family talked about it you know their aunties and, and people just said they're going through the change you know so there is a deficit of knowledge isn't there so this these mm. workshops are good for raising raising awareness and pointing direction of where to go. There's some very good books. Yeah, Deborah Robinson was saying it's treated as taboo. Yes, which is un which is unfortunate. And Lily's talking about night sweats. Night sweats. Are, well, you know, night sweats. You have to manage that. You have a have a dry night in next to you, so you're not too your sleep's not too disturbed. Take off the one you've got on, put on another one, and go back to sleep. You know, you, you kind of get and with the hot flashes, you can run your wrists under a cold water tap, and it kind of pushes back the, that heat um, really quickly. Someone told me that, you know, you just run your, your wrist under the cold tap. Um, yes. Sleep nude. Yes. Only a, sleeping nude. Indeed. Absolutely sleep nude. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. but, but here it's winter time. Unfortunately, Anika, we, we've got all these um, blankets on us in the winter. So, you know, the sheets can get really hot. But in the Caribbean, yes, of course. Absolutely. Just sleep nude. Sleep nude anytime. But yeah, the sheets, the sheets mm -hmm. can get wet. <laughs> cool water. Yeah, we're a bit challenged here. I, I like to say I, I like to say one good reason why it's good too as well, especially if you have a significant other. When we sweat, uh, we also release uh, pheromones on our sheets. So mm. if you notice, sometimes when your significant other gets out of the bed and you are on their side, mm. it's because their DNA, the immune system, is actually on the sheets and on the pillow. So you actually gravitate to the other side to also cuddle to your significant other's pheromone. Someone's, thank you for that, uh, Riel. Someone's asked for a question. I don't know if anyone can answer it from our panel. For those who've had a hysterectomy, how do you tell if you're in perimenopause? It, it, it all depends on the type of hysterectomy you've had, whether you've had a complete hysterectomy where they, they've taken out your ovaries or not. But, the, I'm going to put the link through to the checklist because there are about 21 symptoms you should be checking for. I'm going to put the link, I'm going to do the checklist and put it in the link now and you can go through the checklist and those are indicators. It's what the GPs use as indicators that you might be going through the menopause, you might be perimenopausal. Also, when some women are in cancer treatment, they would go into menopause that is induced by the medication uh, in a hysterectomy as well because it's a clinical experience it is again a forced 
menopause. So in many instances, once there's any interruption in hormonal activity, from a clinical perspective, that will trigger the process of entry into menopause. Thank you. Thank you. Um, understand. So Fatima says, sorry, Dr. Sims, I did not understand uh, the, the ferno. Can you explain a bit more? Yeah, we released, uh, we released, well, just naturally. Uh, huh. Before we go into menopause and we actually um, ovulate, when you ovulate, you release a chemical called compulence. And that's a pheromone that we all smell. Every living, breathing female creature does this, the same thing. When you see a canine and you see male canines running after her, we say she's in what? In heat, right? So it's the same with one man too. When you're ovulating, you also release a pheromone. It's called uh, um, compulence. And us males, when we smell that too as well, it can also cause us to release a chemical called androstenone. This is how people end up having sex on the first night too, because mm -hmm. when the male smells your compulence and releases his androstenone, it, he, it gets to the point where he actually lose his uh, cognitive ability to even decisive whether she's gorgeous or not, because what he's thinking now is to procreate, procreate, procreate. So you release that pheromone to attract the male. Every living, breathing creature does this. It's no different. You know, you release that pheromone. So also when we're sleeping in, in the bed and, and it's, you know, a lot of cover and everything causes us to sweat because most of the time, uh, especially males, we, uh, we release our pheromone through our sweat glands. So when men are working really hard, you know, outside, cutting the grass or whatever, and you find him attractive when you walk past your significant other. Sometimes it may smell really strong, but that's his pheromone that you're actually smelling. The first thing we do as human beings, the men and human beings come together, the first thing we do, is, well, the first two things we do is we do a, a full body scan with our visual cortex, and then we also do a full um, smell. So we smell which, which we call the human leukocyte antigens. And what that is, is we're actually smelling the other person's DNA. We're actually smelling the other person's immune system because that helps us to detect whether this person is dangerous to us or not, right? It lets us know if this person has a pathogen, a virus, or something's wrong with this person. And you might find yourself doing that. It's like, that's why we respond to people with bad breath because it detects that it, it could be a danger or, or a gut infection to the person. And we respond to that, right? We respond to bad smells, right? So that's the first gift that we have by God that gave us to protect ourselves. And one of the protections is smelling and to detect one's what we call the major histocompatibility complex. And that's smelling each other's DNA and immune system. So when you relieve that DNA, when you're asleep in the bed, that DNA goes onto the pillows and it goes onto the sheet. Now, when you are attracted to your significant other, when you like the smell of your significant other, when he or she gets out of the bed and you're still in the bed, you will find yourself gravitating over to your significant other's side. And the reason why you're there is to cuddle. You're cuddling with the smell on the sheets and the pillow. So that's the part that you are actually like, say your person goes out of town and you still have the same sheets there. What happens is, is that your body will naturally gravitate on that side because the body, that's the only thing that you have of your significant other. When we actually lose a significant other, most people don't get rid of their significant other's clothes because of the scent that's on the clothes and you smell the scent. And, but you know, eventually you will have to get rid of them because you'll never be able to detox from your significant other. But that's why we keep those clothes. Even in just a breakup, we keep the clothes. And one of my advices is to get rid of those clothes 
because the DNA, the immune system, the human leukocyte antigens is still on the clothes. And we actually smell those clothes. And what does that do? That triggers our hippocampus where our memory and that causes us to actually be aroused all over again in the ventral tegmental uh, area of the brain, which will cause us to uh, not only just um, uh, make, not only will it, it, it just strikes us to remember that person, but it stimulates the body where we will yearn for that person too as well. You know, so uh, I know I went off a little bit, but it's important just to understand why detoxing is so important and why we have to get rid of you know, clothes and stuff like that because that person's DNA is still on there. Think about when, remember when people break out of prison and they would run through the woods, how would they find them? Or, or when slaves ran, how did they find them? Mm, By dogs. 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 Well, we have the exact same thing. We have the exact same thing. Yeah. Thank you. I've thoroughly so, answered that question. Um, Go on. Can I add something quickly? Um, to mm, sure. So, um, and once again, from a sexology perspective and in terms of what the studies have been showing, um, I don't know, Dr. Sims, if you've come across this, um, that women's ability to sense um, that somebody's a danger or the immune system, you know, isn't working well and therefore they may have an infection or this person is not compatible with me, that ability has been or can be interrupted when we are on hormonal birth control. And so, and so our hormonal birth control throws that ability way off. Um, and so that's something for women to think about when you're choosing your contraceptives. Um, the type of birth control that you're going to choose, because that disrupts that natural ability to do that. I mean, and, and the studies have seemed to be um, affirming this all the time. Um, and, you know, I mean, there have been cases where uh, women who met their partners while they were on the birth control and came off of it during, during some time of the relationship, all of a sudden find, can't figure out why the hell did I choose this partner? Yeah, so I don't know if Dr. Sims came across that, but something for you to, to keep yes. in mind. Okay, we have, we have a question from a member of the audience. Okay, and then, and then can we go back to that? Because yes, that's, that's this person, we, we need to, I, I, yeah, I, I want to work on that. Yeah, okay, like, Nicole, can you put that person yes. off? Um, Ubuntu, raise hand. Um, this question. Hi, good evening. Good um, evening. Wonderful evening. I'm finding it quite fascinating and learning quite a lot. Um, and one of the questions that I wanted to ask, because I heard um, things being discussed in terms of the female genitalia and talking about the G-spot and how the name G-spot has come from a German person. Mm. And it seems that we hear a lot of what I've heard is named after Western European people. So my question is, what is those same said things from an African perspective that may give a different um, emphasis to, oh. to the same thing? about did you join did you join late because our first speaker habib really i mean he got us to stop using the word g-spot so habib yes, over to I, you I, if you're did you, did you hear what habib had to say in the beginning about about the, about, about did, the african I, perspective to this yes and 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 and, 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 and i quite i found it quite fascinating and would probably like to hear more from him um yes. maybe even if i get in contact with him in, in any shape or form. But I found it quite interesting. Also interested in one of the words I don't think I've heard too much yet is sensuality. Sensuality. Mm -hmm. What was your direct because question just now about, to Habib about the African centered? It was, it, it was more to hear what, what are the African expressions? Because when wow. I look into kind of ancient for instance, say ancient Egypt, you will find that the woman was very much revered in ancient Africa. And, you know, you will see the monuments of, of the great images of, of, of the women and the men. Mm -hmm. And even in terms of their sexuality, they were quite explicit in mm -hmm. terms of their sexuality. Mm -hmm. And what I realized in terms of Western sexuality, Western sexuality, Europeans were very inhibited in mm -hmm. terms of so mm -hmm. I'm just kind of really interested in it. 
as we're mm-hmm. talking about it now because we're in a Western culture. Mm. But how do we bring any of that emphasis um, back? back. Of my thinking is right yeah. now. Yes, it's true. We need to change our language and everything. I'm going to ask Habib if he wants to speak on that and maybe Anika. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for the question. That's a very um, good question. And um, obviously, I can't speak on behalf of all of the 50 plus (laughs) African countries, but I'll just give (laughs) like an example of Rwanda. And just trying to illustrate the differences in terms of the way traditional African cultures um, viewed female sensuality and the female anatomy compared to English speaking countries. So even like when we refer to, and a lot of this stems from, um, we've adopted a Victorian Christian understanding about sex, which I mentioned earlier being shameful. So even when we refer to private parts, and uh, there was one really interesting documentary that I um, saw recently. um, And they were exploring um, Kunyaza and Rwanda sexual practices and looking at a labour elongation. And when the, when the, the Dutch director, she was, a, was a white woman, and she was investigating, like, why is it that women elongate their labia? And she was said that in, in her country, the word that, that is used to describe the labia is shameful lips. And then that woman, the African woman, the African Rwandan woman, she said, she was like, she didn't understand. And she said, yeah, we call it shameful lips. And her response was, why would you associate shame with someone that's part of your own body? So you didn't have this concept of your body being shameful. And when someone mentioned earlier about, and sorry, it was yourself, um, Dr. Yvonne, about a number of women do not even look at their own genitalia. This concept wasn't, didn't exist in many traditional African um, cultures. So, and you'll find as well, and um, I'd like to hear Dr. Anika, um, Anika's thoughts on this as well, that you'll find with a number, number of, um, especially Western women or women in general, they complain about not being able to climax, um, not being able to squirt, not being able to ejaculate because they can't get out of their heads because they're conscious, they're very conscious about how they look, how they, how their partner might see them and not negative body image issues. Mm-hmm. Whereas in a lot of traditional African cultures, the body wasn't seen as a, a source of shame. And I think this is something that we've um, mm-hmm. inherited from, um, like I said, the Victorian Christian understanding mm. about sex and being something just for procreation. Even when we talk about sex, it's for procreation. Whereas, like for example, in ancient Arab cultures mm. and even some African cultures, mm. sex was for pleasure. The primary purpose of sex, like so in Arabic, the word that they use for sex is nikah, which means intercourse, and ultimately it comes from pleasure. So the purpose of having intimate connections was to enjoy yourself, and secondary to that was procreation. Whereas in the West, we look at sex as first and foremost for procreation and pleasures and after or if you have pleasure as well that's great yeah. whereas you notice in some other cultures it's the other way around so just interesting how different cultures mm. view intimacy sex and our bodies quite different and just the last thing i'll say um the how the, the this is the legend how it, how it goes and this kind of plays into what the brother was mentioning about how some ancient african cultures how they viewed female sexuality and celebrated it so the story goes, and again, this is legend. It's not necessary. It might not. It might not be true, but this is how the Rwandans kind of teach um, the Kunyaza practice and how it was formed. There was an ancient queen who was um, her husband was away on a military expedition, and she was yearning for some special attention. Yes, I read so that in she, the book. <laughs> so she book. summoned one. I, I love this story, and I'll explain why I love the story. But she summoned one of her guards to make love to her. Then the guard was petrified, and you know he came into her uh, quarters, and he was like said, what about the king? And she said, if you don't make love to me, I'm going to have your husband executed. And I'm going to have you executed, sorry. So he, he was um, worried, anxious, and he was holding his manhood and he was starting to shake. And the shake, and the story goes that as he was shaking, holding his manhood, he struck her magic beam, the Rogongo, which is basically the clitoris. And from there, a uh, gush of water that emanated from her loins and from there formed Lake Kiva, which is one of the biggest lakes in East Central Africa. But <laughs> And then well, when the king came back, then she told her husband, this is how I want you to make love to me. It's not always about penetration. I don't want you always to enter me. First, I want you to practice kunyata. I stimulate my magic being, the clitoris and the lips um, in this rhythmic fashion. And then I can um, ex- elicit this um, gush of fluid. But one of the beautiful things I find about this story is that the woman, A, took ownership of her own pleasure. And it was focused on female pleasure as opposed to always about the men 
And she taught her husband when he came back from this expedition, this is how I want you to pleasure me. And from there, you see women after women teaching younger generations, future generations, and also men teaching the younger men about how they should, when they're going into sex, and the idea in traditional random cu cultures, sex is for the woman. So it's very different to how we see sex, is that it's all about penetrative intercourse, it's all about male pleasure, it's all about, and, and they say that a man is less than a man if he can't find the water. So the mm. pressure is placed on the man, whereas in Western culture, very often the pressure is placed on the woman in order to please the man. So it's quite refreshing that you've got like a different um, like stance where, like I said, female sexuality, female sensuality is celebrated and revered. So that's something which hopefully it would be nice if that was brought into Western culture. So there's some balance, shall mm. we say. That's why I think the book, I, I love the book. I love that story, I saw that story in the book. And I think people should buy the book and shove it under their partner's noses or just have it on the coffee table. Just, just buy the book. So <laughs> read it. It's, 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 a, it's a great book. Uh, Yancy just put the link to the book in the chat. And I just think, you know, Christianity, the way they've, you know, marched in and sliced up the, the continent and Christianity. I mean, I was so shocked to visit West Africa, West African countries for work over the last 10 years and see how, how you know, this Christianity has taken a, such a grip on, on the nations. Uh, it's such a sad thing. When you think we have such a rich history, a rich culture, that um, uh, it's, it's, it really does pain my heart. And this religion, um, yeah, someone wise as a colonialism lives on. Yes, it does live on. And it's impacted in so many ways, you know, trade, uh, health, uh, uh, sexuality, intimacy, everything is just impacted on everything. Like, yeah, but we, reminded me about the shame, and the Caribbean is the same. You know, the shame associated with with what should be just a natural, pleasurable experience for for everybody. Anyway, enough. Um, Anika, did you want to say anything on that topic in terms of because you you're 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 not you don't seem to be so tarnished by the whole Western thing. <laughs> Oh gosh, um, that's because I, had, I, I did my own unlearning um, and my own coming to terms um, cool. with my sexuality. So I went through my journey and my process. Uh, so I can't speak directly to any particular um, African names or, you know, proverbs. Um, I know that there are, there are probably hundreds because, I mean, it's a huge continent. And then within each nation, there are many different nations. I, I like to use the word nations and not tribes. There are many, many different nations within a, within a nation. Um, and um, what I have discovered in at least one particular um, West African slash Nigerian tradition, like the, the Ifa tradition, um, is that they have a very, I mean, they're very sex positive. Um, and they refer to different parts of the body in, in terms of energy. So every single body part has an energy to it. it ha every single body part has a role. Um, and, and therefore, when these, when these genitals come together, there is, there's literally uh, a, also a spiritual element um, to, to sexual intercourse. And so, and I've discovered this through many different um, African cultures that um, for, for them, sex was also just another way of connecting with the divine. And I ended up studying mm. as um, learning about Ifa spirituality because I was looking for traditions from the continent um, outside of what has been taught within the spiritual aspect of sexuality, mm -hmm. from the Asian um, area. So you have the Tantra and you have the Taoist and, you know, the Tantra and Taoist practices. Um, they give specific ways in which to use sex for healing. Um, just as you, you I mean, I'm, many of us are familiar with reflexology where you're touching different parts of the foot that are supposed to be connected to different organs in the body. Um, there's also um, genital reflexology, um, which means that the specific parts of the um, vulva and the vagina and specific parts of the penis, when it's massaged or touched, is also linked to specific organs in the body and therefore can aid in healing. And so if you have people coming together, at least in a heterosexual sense, where this part of the penis is connecting with this part of the vulva, um, those energies are interacting and bringing healing, especially if it's intentional. Um, and so there were very specific ways of engaging in sexual uh, interaction or sexual intercourse that are meant to bring healing to each partner. And, and it, I mean, there are rituals and there are specific steps uh, in, which, in, which, in which that is carried out. And so in trying to find something 
coming onto the continent, you know, I came across um, Ifa traditions. I, we haven't gotten to the part of intercourse as yet, and you know, and how they see sexual intercourse. But it was really refreshing to know um, that one, their sexuality has been very fluid in terms of they believe that um, a, a body can be male but have a, any kind of mix of masculine or feminine energy. Um, and so it gave a lot of room for accepting people who accept, well, gave a lot of room for getting rid of the binary in terms of how we see people. So we're not just men and women, we're not just male and female. And, and that view, that belief has been part of many um, African traditions for literally centuries. Um, and so, you know, now you have the Western world trying to catch up and having this LGBTQ thing when our ancestors had those views literally for centuries. Um, and um, so that's something to think about. So definitely some research has to be done. There definitely needs to be some documenting um, of what's on um, the African continent. But there are many, 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 many forms of sex positivity um, in which they do not even separate sex from spirituality. Like it's not two mm. separate things. Once you're having sex, there is a spiritual component or a sacred component to it. Thank you for that. We have a question about FGM, but I suspect, I mean, the continent is huge and there are so many different countries and different um, nations within countries, as you said, and not use the word tribe. So somebody asked about FGM, but I would imagine the people who practice FGM maybe have a different view about um, sexual pleasure and intimacy. Is anybody on the panel want to, to grab that one? Um, go ahead. Yes, go ahead. No, sorry, I interrupted you, sorry. No, go ahead, Habib. No, I will let Anika speak first, sorry, and then I'll, if, you, if that's all right. Or do you want me to no, go first? Anika, yeah, Anika just spoke. She just finished speaking. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to, um, just wanted to, yeah, sorry, just wanted to clarify by, um, and again, that's why it's important we understand, um, with FGM, what are, we, what are we referring to? And the reason why I'm saying that so female genital mutilation is what people commonly known as FGM, which the World Health Organization said there's four basic types. Now, the reason why I'm, I'm saying that we have to be, be very careful and understand what we're speaking about as FGM, because when um, a lot of when Westerners came across labor elongation called Gokuna in parts of East, East Central Africa, um, they initially classified it as a form of FGM, female genital mutilation. Mm. And then it took for some African sexologists to then say, why are you calling this? Okay, if you don't like this practice, fair enough, but to say it's, a, it's barbaric and it's a form of mutilation because it doesn't adhere to your ideals, that's incorrect. And then they changed it and then they said, it's not FGM, they called it FGMO, meaning uh -oh. female, genital, female genital modification. Oh dear. And my point in saying this is that there's a lot of people that, again, I'm not for or advocate for FGM at all. I, don't, I think it's bar barbaric, but I'm saying it's important that we understand the differences and what we're speaking about when we're speaking about FGM. So in some parts of, um, in a number of, for example, Muslim countries in, in Africa and in Asia, they perform um, what they consider to be um, female circumcision, which they consider to be a lesser form of FGM. And that involves the um, excision of the clitoral hood, which is equivalent of the, of the foreskin. Right. And that's so when it's done in that, that part of the world, the Western world would say that's FGM. When it's done in the Western world, and again, I'm not talking about children, I'm speaking of adults, it's called clitoridectomy and it's a it's a procedure that if someone wants to do it, it's an it's a cosmetic procedure. Do you understand what I'm getting at? So I'm oh, just yeah, saying yeah. It's, very, it's very important. I'm not speaking about um like type two, type three with like the pharaonic form of FGM. I'm speaking about sometimes there are some practices which is done in Africa and Asia that the Europeans will say this is FGM but if it's done in the Western world or if the Western world for example for women were to practice labiaplasty where she wants to have this so-called vagina um, um Barbie vagina designer oh, vagina yes. mm, form, mm, that's mm. not FGM that's a woman within her mm. right wanting to make her, for aesthetic reasons so yes. that's why I'm saying it. Mm. even as black people or African people or from the Caribbean it's important that when these terms and things are because it can trigger people, because automatically, of course, her FGM, everyone's against it. No one wants um, uh, and would support a woman being mutilated at all. 
Mm. But I'm just saying it's important we understand because there's even a number of um, um, sexologists who are saying that male circumcision is also a form of mutilation as well. And because we haven't heard about that much and that hasn't really gathered much weight, but then it's like and there's a number of people that and, and, and men who have been circumcised for generally for religious or cultural reasons, I don't think they look at themselves as they're being um, mutilated or deformed. Do you understand what I'm getting to that? So that's what I'm just saying. Exactly. It's, important first, it's important we first clarify what are you speaking about when you're saying which F, what FGM and, and what, what type of practices are you, are you talking about? And then we can talk about, because the reason why I'm saying this, if you've got someone or people from a, a certain religious background or cultural background that they believe that this is part of their custom or is part of their religion, it would be very difficult for them to change their ways for an outsider to say without understanding where did this where does this come from so for example mm. in muslim cultures or and um, muslim communities some people mistakenly believe that this circumcision or fgm is from the religion when it's not so that's why you probably you need to educate them from a religious perspective that it's not from god if that makes sense mm. and then the, and then you can maybe bring in the scientific and other evidence but if you're just coming in with like a sense of um i loved what anika mentioned about western societies being weird you know, this arrogance that, no, this is the way you need to, and not respecting mm. the cultures of different people and mm. understanding, okay, this, that, what you're doing, what are the reasons for you um, having this um, practice? Mm. And then you can empower and educate people and change and change and stop these type of practices. But I'm just saying, I just wanted to reiterate that mm. when we see these terms, it's important we first clarify and check what are they actually referring to? Because if it's like, again, like labia elongation, you might not like it, that's fine. But it's quite interesting that, in the Western world, because of like with porn, everyone's obsessed with a woman having like very tucked in so-called mm. perfect lips. Yeah, exactly. Whereas in, in East and Central Africa, they proudly want the lips to be protruding and elongated and out. So it's a different yeah. mindset. Yeah. Not mm. one is better than the other, but we just need to understand what we're speaking mm. about before we condemn and say this is like, um, yeah, so I just wanted it's, to it's, it's a, Thank you so much for that. It's a bit like the Barbie doll image that we're supposed to all aspire to in the West. When, when black women are, are, are made to look far more different. Yes, exactly what Habib was, exact, sorry, exactly what Habib was saying, because uh, in many of the communities where I've actually been engaging with women who have had vaginal uh, cutting or other types of vaginal adjustments, so to speak, it all depends on the relevance of their culture. It all depends on what is their tradition? And absolutely, yes, the Western world has imposed one unique label on it. And in labeling it, it's actually changed the whole social and cultural dynamic. It's brought about quite a lot of negative connotations. And it also just calls everything mutilation. And in fact, we really have to look at the various categories and we've spent quite a lot of time delving into that over the years in the sexual and reproductive health discussions around women's health globally. So thank yes, thank you, Habib. Thank you for that, Nicole. And thank you so much, Habib, for really drilling down on that, on, on that one for the, for, the, for the group. Brilliant. I'm it's sorry, so, just, to add, sorry yeah, just, sure. just to add to that. I'm sure many people are familiar with Sarah Bartman's story. And if oh, not, yes, absolutely. I am. Mm. I remember how she was demonized because of yes. her large buttocks and protruding awesome. and protruding labia as well. People don't talk about that. Mm. And they and mm. they cut off her lips and they used it as a and it was in a lot of museums, even in France up until very recently. So this yes. is something that like I said, we need to challenge and understand when they are okay. labeling people as freaks yes. or abnormal, is it because they don't go they're not adhering to the aesthetic norm of Europeans? Yeah. Only so only to see how many how many how many how many years later that they're now, um, everyone's now rushing to get their ass bigger. Exactly. <laughs> it's, it's bizarre, isn't it? It's so bizarre. Mine's natural. Anyway, <laughs> any, any questions? Any questions, Nicole? Um, somebody wants to go back to the topic um, about sex and how contraception affects our sex drive and our sex lives. So are we allowed to go back there? Do you want to go back there? Um, We've got 15 minutes left, I think, um, um, in terms of time. Is there anything 
anything fresh? Any new? Anybody hands up a new a new thing? Nothing new. Um, does anybody want to? Can I can I ask a question? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Um, coming back to the um, vulva cuttings. Are these vulva cuttings done for the purpose of the woman or, or men when it comes to sex? Anybody? Can answer that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, sorry. That was, yeah, very good question. Traditionally, with a lot of cultures, um, it's done... Um, it's a form of abuse, really, because it's, tr it's, a, it's a way to kind of control female sexuality. So this idea that if we remove the, um, the, the, the clitoral glands, in some, in, in some cases, unfortunately, the, not only the clitoral glands, but also the labia lips are removed, this idea that a woman will not commit fornication or she'll be less desirous of men. And this is something that, so again, it's, it's a practice that, again, I'm, I'm not by all means... Um, promoting or, or advocating for, but a lot of times it's done um, to, in terms of the FGM, it's, it's done to kind of control female sexuality. And, and some cultures look at it as a way that it's, it says that there's a form of FGM, I can't remember if it's one or four, where the, um, the lips are sewn together and they just leave a small, very small mm -hmm. hole. Mm -hmm. And the whole idea is this, will, um, it's done for the man's pleasure because the man wants a very, it's believed that he wants a very small orifice. And also it, it's said that it will help a woman's um, ability to get married. So there's a lot of like mm. marital issues. It's, it's seen as like, it will help her. So ultimately a lot of those is done really for, for men, not obviously for, for women, mm. unfortunately. But I just wanted to, when I went on a little bit of a rant, so I do apologize a bit earlier, just to clarify the differences when we're speaking about FGM. So not everything that is um, a vulval procedure, shall mm. we say, is necessarily FGM, and that's what I wanted yeah. to clarify. But generally, a lot of the the practices are done to um, control women's sexuality, and is and it's something that's abusive, and not something that I definitely would mm -hmm. um, encourage, and something we need to kind of put to an end. But it needs education and understanding the, the culture. Mm. And I've spoken to a midwife about that, and um, it's 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 quite something for the women who've had that the, the sewn up situation. Okay. Yes, um, it pretty much. Just to interject a bit, it's pretty much to manage promiscuity, so to speak. Mm. And in some traditions, they go as far as to do breast ironing, which oh, yes. also, again, mm. impacts on the girl's sexuality mm. by way of controlling body development, mm. breast development, which will, in their minds, lead to promiscuity as well. Mm. So in those traditions where... It's applicable to just the genitalia. That's one mm. thing. But then, because the breasts are visible, in some cultures, it's also applicable to having that as part of the tradition. Mm. And in fact, about three years ago, there, there was a new reign you know, of advocacy going around in the diaspora communities because what they found was that a lot of these traditions were coming, particularly breast ironing, was becoming very prominent and very popular in some of the diaspora communities, like in London, in New York, uh, anywhere where there was a migrant population, they were seeing a uh, very strong participation in these practices by the elder women in the community. And I wanna also say most of these practices are initiated and done by women. Mm. Mm. That's that, that's the thing. Any thank you for that, Nicole. Thank you very much. Any other questions, Nicole? Mm -hmm. Anybody There's else? More questions, but it's still on the FGM topic, talking about the evolution. How did it evolve? I'm putting Maybe. a link up for a book so for people to go and get a book to read up more on it. Um, by Zimran. There's a book here: Female Genital Mutilation Law and Practice by Zimran Samuel. Uh, for people who want to know more about that. Can I mention um, a little bit about the birth control? Birth control, yep. Uh, and then we're going to have last comments and then oh, we close. I mention, because she asked, she asked me if I came across that. I actually did a tour 
uh, until the uh, pandemic hit. And I think it's really important too for young ladies who are taking uh, birth control. I was involved in one of the research with the GGI and we did, we followed some of the other research as well. And it was very shocking to me to actually discover that it really held a lot of validity to support its claim. And mm -hmm. um, we had a lot of uh, women to tell us that it actually happened to them when they got married on the birth control pill and then came off the birth control pill to actually have kids, then they actually looked at them totally different and said, wow, you know, what would, I, I can't believe that I even married this person. And one of the major studies was we showed, um, we showed uh, uh, women baby pictures and we asked them to rate the baby pictures between one and 10. And uh, they rated the baby pictures at 10 when they were on the birth control pills, when they came off the birth control pills, they rated the babies as four and five. So we said that you know that you actually rated them 10. Mm -hmm. And they said, wow, I thought I rated them uh, four and five. It was like, no, you rated them 10. So some said, well, I guess I really wasn't telling the truth, right? And that's how we find that most of the divorce too rate is because of this, but they're not talking about it because of this billion dollar business you know, that's going on. And um, actually, so when this information is have now is out now, uh, they decided to try to, to let kids come and buy birth control pills without parental um, uh, permission or through the schools. So soon you'll hear birth control pills could be, uh, you know, you just go to the store and buy them without any permission because now they're, they're, they're figuring out another way that they could still make money off of it before um, Onika and I get this information out there, right? Because um, it's really, really important because it has a major effect. Think about this. Uh, like I said, it's a, you know, I have a long um, uh, study on it when I, when I was touring it, but to be real short, uh, you have to think about everything that I mentioned about how we attract other men when you take the birth control pills, because birth control pills uh, manipulate the body into believing it's what? Pregnant. Mm. So if it's pregnant, then it stops everything that you have to attract a man to you. So when mm. we're talking about, you know, when you ovulate and release those certain uh, pheromones, it stops that. When you are ovulating, uh, you also have a extra switch to your waist to hip ratio that stops. Your pupils also widen when you are attracted to a, a male. That also stops. Your voice change when you're ovulating. That also stops because your voice change to sound more sexier to a male. Well, that stops. Your symmetric symmetry also change when you ovulate. That stops. You look the same because the symmetric symmetry of your face tries to change in a way to attract the male too as well. So that stops. All of these things that we attract will also be cut off because the body says, why do we need that? Why should we do this? Because we're already pregnant. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. Thank you so much. We've, um, we've posted some um, literature um, where people can follow up. I mean, I think we've been posting books all through this uh, event. Um, Dr. Yance has posted, um, Habib has posted, um, um, Nicole has sent links. So we try to, to provide supplementary information uh, because we know we can't cover everything here. And some people might want to follow up, not everybody. So th thanks to everyone who shared information, all our guests as well, who shared links and shared books and stuff, really important. And also getting stuff from an African perspective, so important so that we can, like you say, change the narrative and stop using these German terminologies because um, we know we know different now. Are there any final uh, questions? Anything, anybody, any burning issues anybody would like to raise? Um, Fatima just asked if there's another meeting. We'll have another event at the end of May. I think it's the 27th. I need to check, double check. And uh, with your permission, I will. I can. I can email you from the. Um, Eventbrite, those who booked for Eventbrite. Um, it, it, it will be equally engaging as this one. It's the, I think, it's, I think we've, we've said it's the 20, is it the 24th or 17th? 
22nd, I think. My final facts is upset. May, April. Oh, May. Sorry, May. 22nd. 22nd of May, yeah? Yeah, that was the date we said. Yeah, that's it. Yes. So that's a date for our, our next event, and it will be around health. They'll be looking at um, alternative health practitioners, some really powerful people in the field. And of course, Yancy will be talking about menopause. <laughs> and um, so if you have, think about your questions around menopause before the next one, we'll be here to answer them. Somebody said she has a mirror in her hand. Yes, don't forget to do the homework. Mm -hmm. Yancy, <laughs> you need to tell us you've done the homework for, by the next, uh, next one as well. Um, so our guests, are there any final words you'd like to say? So shall we start with Habib? Anything, any final word, Habib? Um, and I'll just go around to everybody. Oh uh, yeah, sorry, I was just actually typing. Um, there's a really good documentary um, on Kunyaza and um, um, where you've got women speaking. Um, I'm, I'm pitching it because I worked with the BBC on it, but it's <laughs> called <laughs> Rwanda <laughs> Sexual <laughs> Pledge and Controversy. I was just typing actually in the chat. Yeah, so type it. Yeah, so it's, it's an 11 minute documentary where you've got um, Rwandan sexologists, women speaking amongst themselves about different practices, both Kunyaza and labor elongation. So I definitely would recommend people checking it out. And then there's yeah. a full length um, audio documentary called The Orgasm Gap, um, mm. which is on BBC World Service. So I'll try and oh. send the links. But yeah, I'll definitely go, recommend it. Go, Akeem. Nice one. Are you planning to do more research? Like, you know, to get uh, the, no. the African version of the Kumasatra, like, are you planning to do some from different countries or? Um, well, I'm working on, another, I've got another book I'm working on called about, um, sexual compatibility called Woman of Desire Guides because basically what I'm trying to a lot of my work I'm actually concentrating on men because Good. I think there's a disconnect yes. um, like I mentioned earlier between men and I, I'm trying to speak to men in a language that they understand and I think yes. someone was asking earlier that where are the men or why they need this information I had funny enough I had a workshop yesterday with um, men mainly from the United States and a lot of men they do want to learn they but they do. just need safe spaces where they can be comfortable yes. to speak because I think what a lot of men are worried about is that they might say the wrong thing or they might offend. And if they come across like um, what appears to be um, a female um, majority space, they don't feel that they can kind of, and again, we've got ego as well. So we don't want to come across as not yeah. knowing what to do in a bedroom kind of thing. So that's why um, I'm trying to, yeah, I'm trying to, the, the new book is for both men and women, but I'm also conscious that, okay, men, because it's great that women are being empowered and we've got a lot of women spaces. But again, it's, but especially in terms of the heterosexual relationships, we need more men on board if we want to kind of close the pleasure gap and have, and have um, pleasurable relations between the two genders. So, um, but yeah. That is amazing work. Women can't, I don't think there's work that for women, I think, I think men need to speak to men. But maybe that's maybe that's not a very okay or right on comment. But yeah, I'm glad you're doing Absolutely. that work. Yeah, I agree really, I'm glad you're doing that work. Yeah, men need to feel comfortable to speak to say, you know, what's bugging them, and they they need to they need that space. They really do. So yeah, good on you. Yeah, I like to help with her bag. Her bag. You'd like to yeah. So make the connection. Yes, there you go, Habib. You've got you've got support. Rial says he wants to. Get in there. Um, have you got a final word, Nicole, you'd like to say as we wrap up? Yes. I want us to talk about breasts differently. On the continent and in so many other cultures, we use the wrong word. Mm -hmm. We use the incorrect word. We use words that are negative in connotation. We use words that are to prevent us from embracing the truth about our anatomy. The breasts are so connected to our sexuality and to reproductive health. We leave the upper half of the body of the woman and the girl out of every reproductive health conversation. I want us to stop looking at breasts differently so that we can all apply the correct label so that they are treated with more regard and respect, except when a woman is breastfeeding or when she's diagnosed with breast cancer. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please, um, speakers, don't forget to post your Instagram, your Facebook in the chat, um, you know, so that people can connect with you. Um, 
Bonica Henry, are you, do you have any last comments you'd like to leave with us? Uh, so I, I just want to say Habib and I seem to be on the same uh, trajectory, at least in terms of educating men. Um, that is one of my upcoming projects, looking at putting together a workshop for men. Um, I'm literally doing marketing training now so I can figure out what's the right language to use. But men would actually be interested in coming to, um, to a workshop, to training about being better lovers. Um, maybe, maybe you can work with some of the men to do it. Yeah, oh, yes. I'm, I'm working with a man to do it. Oh, you work with a man. Okay, right. Yeah. That's one thing. How are you going to do that on your own, man? Mm. Yep, yep. Working, definitely working with a man. And I have sons, so it's important that I do Oh, yeah. Mm, mm. Sons. Um, like and so that's also helpful because that's a whole other demographic as well. You know, they're young men. Mm, mm. And so they, of course, need to help. Um, I just want to remind people to embrace uh, their sexuality as another aspect of their well-being. So want to encourage people to think of, to begin to think of sex in decolonizing and anti-colonizing ways. There is so, there's so much unhealthy and and harmful things that we have as part of our legacy. Mm. Uh, Caribbean here from colonialism um, and from slavery mm. needs to be undone. That needs to be let go. Otherwise, we're going to be hitting our heads against a wall. Yes. Um, battle to yes. make sexuality and sexual health accessible to everybody, regardless of gender, yes. regardless of race, regardless yeah. of religion. We are really missing a huge chunk of our well being when we ignore. Our sexuality so and i think a- it's affecting the strength of our community our unity our trust i think it's really affecting all those things to be fair the yes. fact that we've lost kind of lost our way because of colonialism and interference in our cultures we, we've lost our way you know this in so many different aspects of life taking on a western um way of being it doesn't serve us it hasn't served us and it continues not to serve us we need, right now, we need to build unity more than anything with love, trust, you know, compassion for each other, care, you know, honesty, everything. We really need to start really loving each other in a very deep, and meaningful way. Sorry, that was my <laughs> worth. But yes, I, I really do appreciate the work you're, you're doing. Um, um, Real Sims, Real Sims, thank you so much for joining us again. Do you have any final words you'd like to say? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm also interested, too, as well. That's another thing uh, when, when I mentioned earlier about the message to men is that you have to know more about uh, foreplay and taking your time to make sure that she's ready in the process. So that's been my uh, motivation, too, in the future is to talk to men about, you know, how to please women. Um, as uh, Habib had mentioned, too, because it's all about just pleasing yourself learning things how to please man mm-hmm. and we just rush into and not realizing that there is also a, a, a process to make sure that a uh, woman is pleased too mm-hmm. as well so mm-hmm. and, and and i say my quote is preparing yourself is to prevent repairing yourself <laughs> i like that preparing yourself is to prevent repairing yourself i have not heard that before well done thank you very much nice one yeah, nice so takeaway well um, okay, Yancy. Yes, hi. This, just a couple of things before I say, um, I wrap up. That some of the work we do is with the LGBTQIA plus community. And though we don't mention specific um, sexualities within our discussions here, they're not to be left out at all. And I think it's important that um, we create safe space for some of those who are in danger. We know for a fact that they experience disproportionate amounts of discrimination and prejudice and bias. So it's important that we create safe spaces for them um, and and us as a collective to, um, yeah, to have these discussions there as well. So it's not just a male and a female discussion. But what, in closing, what I really wanted to say to everyone here is just about loving your bodies. I'll tell you what. The cosmetic industry loves our body, you know, they love our body. You go to the supermarket or the chemist and the numbers of 
intimate products you see, mainly targeted at women. I have a question for the men, you know, you don't need to answer it, but I'm going to say it anyway. Why, why don't I see a shelf full of products, deodorants that make men's willies, penises smell nice? You know, you go there and they're shelves upon shelves of soaps for women vaginas and deodorants for women vaginas and intimate wipes for women vaginas. I've never seen one for male male penises. Habib, answer me this. I think I, I would say that the cosmetic industry doesn't actually love women's body bodies. I think they promote women's they play on women's insecurities. Yes, that's and all I think they that's do. why there's so many products. You don't have many products with, with men because, yes, penises come in different shapes and sizes, and we are taught from a relatively young age to accept that. Whereas women are being taught, are being taught, taught and socially conditioned to seek perfection, which mm. we know is unattainable. Mm. Whereas men, we're, we, we're taught to be courageous. So yeah. we can accept our flaws, we can accept where we've got issues, but we, can, we try to overcome that. Whereas women are being taught you need to be perfect. And mm -hmm. that's why they sell and promote all of these products to get this perfect shape, perfect figure, pay, perfect vulva. And that's why they just, it's basically about money ultimately. Yep. So mm -hmm. that's why I don't think you have these products for men. Absolutely. It's actually called, yeah. it's called a pink economy. Yeah. And so yeah. much of it is targeted towards women's insecurities. Mm -hmm. And of course I work very closely with the plastic surgeon, sometimes from the clinical and uh, post-operative in terms of the mastectomy and oncological perspective. But sometimes I work with them on the vanity side. And most times the woman is going there because of her self-esteem. And many times there's had to be interventions where I have to be called in have a psychologist called in as well because a surgery that had certain expectations didn't go the way quite the way it was supposed to and sometimes that woman her cost is not necessarily financial it's highly emotional and it's longer term because a revision surgery is never a guarantee either so the pink economy is real and uh, Sometimes we have to agitate against it and push back because it speaks to every single product that affects a woman from her sanitary napkin, right down to, as Yancy said, some of the inappropriate products for giving us that sense of not being adequate because we need to address our smell and we need to address so many of the things. So they become vanity products and we spend a lot of money on them. That's right. They, they make millions off of us. They, they love us. They see us as, you know, a, an economy for them. It's bottomless pit. Um, so we need to look after ourselves. I, I don't want to walk around with my, my vulva and my vagina smelling of baby fresh or freshly picked roses or whatever the nonsense smells are. But they keep, you know, they, they keep bombarding us with that. <laughs> Um, so but can we can we get back to the topic of um, self love? Um, so loving ourselves mm -hmm. is about taking care of ourselves. Yes. And um, in in every aspect, you know, one of one of the um, guests has has messaged me um, saying, you know, um, so how do we how do we you know find love? And the topic didn't say about finding love. The topic said we're talking about intimacy and self love. And we've, talking, we've talked about intimacy. All our speakers talked about intimacy at length. And um, we've talked about self-love in that context as yeah. well. But I don't think we ever promised that we would say, how do you find love? Yeah. Um, so I don't know if anybody wants to address that. I think that's a whole topic, a whole different, it was in line with our relationships conversation really. But I think we must not get away from the self-love bit because that is, you want, you want a relationship, you want that type of love, love yourself first. You yes. gotta love you before you can actually bring others in to love you. Love Thank your you. body, love who you are, Thank you know. You. Treat your body parts with the love and take care and attention that you want and you deserve. That's right. So, so yes. Yeah, so, like go on. Yes. Uh, yeah, I just like to say, you know, I am. Yeah. I'm also a counselor, you know, for singles and uh, couples. So once uh, Dr. Yancey said, once you discover love, self, 
then that's when you venture into the relationship arena. So, um, you know, I help with both of that. I help, you know, to, to help you uh, discover self and how to love self. You know, my program, I, you know, start there because a lot of people come to me and they want to, they want counseling for relationships. So what do I do? How do I do? And I'm like, you're not even ready to, to, to go into the relationship. You know, you have to deal with self first, mm -hmm. right? So uh, I put my email up too as well. If, Thank if, you. If somebody's interested in counseling as yeah. well. Th thank you. Please put all your contacts up. It's very important. So to the person who was asking me, you know, so th this probably this is why the, the, the event seems skewed, maybe seems a bit skewed, because we believe that, you know, self-love is, 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 is the place where you start. And if you remember, I don't know if you were here at the beginning, you know, our last event, um, women had homework, women and men, to, to understand their bodies, because we found that there were so many people, people who have been married for 40 years, who've never, ever examined their own private parts, which, which, which is really interesting, um, let alone younger people. So self-love is looking after your well-being and your happiness and knowing who you are, you have to just put in the chat, in the chat and, and setting boundaries. Boundaries are really important as well. So that is a, is a foundation for finding love. You know, we, 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 don't, we don't profess to, to have any kind of magic wand here in our events, but I tell you what, you attend our sessions and you'll certainly become more enlightened as to the tools you need to make yourself more attractive to finding somebody. Um, so we're, we're approaching the end. I want to thank all, all my guests. Habib has been uh, absolutely um, amazing. Your book is incredible. I'm so glad I had a chance to read it. Thank you, Yancy. And, um, and actually meeting you and listening to you. I could listen to you all day long. Um, Real Sims, well, of course, always, always full of lots of gems and, and stories and stuff. And of course, our breast esteem person, uh, Nicole, is a, is a regular. And of course, she's full of good information. And the breasts are important, indeed. And the way um, Nicole crunches it, you know, she leaves you in no doubt about the importance of breasts. And I've learned a lot since, since doing this and having Nicole join us. I've learned so much. Um, Onika, well, Onika Henry, mm, that's on a whole other level. Thank you so much for gracing us with your presence. You've taught me a lot today and I'm sure we've all learned a lot from you and the way you work and your style and your your process and your, your uh, African-centered um, approach both you and Habib is, is absolutely fantastic and um, yeah I'll leave Yancy to do the last last words and then we'll I want to thank all of you who attended as well and stayed um, we really appreciate you coming. And of course, I'll invite you all to our next event. And if you, if you enjoyed yourself, do tell uh, someone else. And if you, if you thought there was anything challenging, do let us know. Um, so over to you, um, Yancy. Thanks very much. Um, just to say quickly, I understand some people had some issues with the link um, joining earlier. So on behalf of all of us, we apologize. We hope we've made it up to you. Tell a friend to tell a friend because these, these sessions are so valuable. We all learn, I learn. And one of the things that I do is the information doesn't stay just here in this space. So we've got our website, we've got our Facebook page, we upload information. But one of the things that we also do is we challenge the medics, we challenge those decision makers, we challenge those who make policy. So the, the information from here actually helps inform national policy. So feel free, share information, send us emails. If you don't really want to talk in the chat, send us emails because the more information we have, the better it is. We just want to make a change. It's open to everyone. This isn't a us situation. This is a collective. We are a village trying to make a difference there's hardly any information that talks about the black body so we are here to put it out there into the mainstream thank you thank you thank you if you want to see a recording of this hop over to our website um actually our youtube channel i just seen brandish just put it in the chat actually 
hop over to our YouTube channel. It should be there in the next couple of hours. We will keep you posted on our next event. If you have speakers that may be interested, suggest them to us, but make sure you tell a friend to tell a friend. Thank you. So with that, I'll say um, good night and goodbye. And thank you for making this an absolutely fantastic event. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank, thank you, you, thank you.